Shalom, 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 Israel. This is uh, Captain Paul Israel from Kingdom Builders of Israel, LLC. And today's class topic is going to be on Egyptology Madness, the short version. Okay, today's class topic is going to be on Egyptology Madness, the short version. Okay, uh, today is going to be a good visual lesson uh, to show the foolishness of Egyptology. Uh, if you look at past history, our people always flocked to learn the ways of the Egyptians, okay? Even to this very day, uh, as we've seen uh, throughout, I guess, the 90s and 80s and so forth, so forth, we've seen, like, celebrities flocking towards to Egyptology. And we know, of course, according to the Holy Bible, Yahweh is against our people following Egyptology ways, Okay, because many people of today, they always refer to themselves as kings and queens uh, based upon going towards Egyptology philosophy as the pharaohs and the queens of Egypt. Okay, so when they say kings and queens, they're referring back to the Egyptology ways of life. And we, the children of Israel, always just went off of being the chosen people of Yahweh. Okay these things as far as kings and queens understanding uh goes back to egypt okay of course we did have kings set up in israel okay but we didn't refer to our women as queens in israel okay so that is a heathen custom okay uh we have to come back to righteousness and we're going to get into uh the lesson real quick with just um one chapter in a few verses in uh, the book of Leviticus chapter 18 verse 2 uh, this is Yahweh commanding Moses to speak to the children of Israel okay this is the book of Leviticus chapter 18 verse 2 it says speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them I am Yahweh your your Elohim you see this I am Yahweh your Elohim this is Yahweh speaking to us okay through Moses uh, this is Leviticus chapter 18 verse 3 after the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. So again, we're not supposed to walk in the ordinances, the ways, the customs of the Egyptians or the so-called African nation, which uh, the land of Canaan, you had other hermetic or african uh nations or tribes in this particular region okay and this is uh the things that our people have to understand we cannot follow the customs of the so-called african nation okay so yes we may uh of course look just like the so-called african nation based upon our skin complexion right as far as being different shades of brown but we are not the same people okay so and also we witnessed in the 90s where we had some celebrities, you know, uh, glamorize or gloat about the Egyptians. OK, and they put it in music videos like I'm, I'm not sure if y'all familiar with the Michael Jackson uh, video called uh, Remember the Time. You know, you had Michael Jackson in the video. You had Eddie Murphy. And I believe you had this um, this black model also in the uh, video as one of the queens okay and then uh, also eddie murphy was playing the egyptian pharaoh okay and also i believe we had uh 
the basketball player Magic Johnson in the video too as well. I'm not really sure if I can recollect, but I believe he was in the video as well. Uh, but we supposed to follow the Most High Yah's law, statutes, and commandments. Okay, and these are the things and the customs we supposed to do. So now we go to, of course, Leviticus chapter 18 verse 4. This is what Yahweh says. It says, "Ye shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances." To walk therein i am yahweh your elohim so that's what yahweh said we are his children okay so we supposed to walk after his ordinances not the egyptians okay and this is what our people are still embracing that philosophy in this video of egyptian or egyptology madness uh short version video is going to show the foolishness that the egyptians or the egypt philosophy believes in and follows and when you look at this video even though i brought out this video on egyptology is not of the most high uh, video on kingdom builders of israel lc youtube page i brought it out and of course i showed the difference between what yahweh did for us by redeeming us out of the land of egypt by putting uh egypt you know by putting um yahweh put egypt you know gods on blast by being not real in order to redeem the children of israel out of egypt okay so out of all the idol gods that you've seen the egyptians had they could not stop yahweh's judgment and this is what this video is going to show the uh the philosophy of the egyptians as being just made up okay so we need to stop embracing this egyptology foolishness so I had to do this short video so y'all can just see it for yourself, okay, and wake our people up out of sleep, okay? So follow this Bible. This is the only truth that we have, okay, this holy Bible. Because looking at this uh, video that you're about to see of Egyptology and what the Egyptians believed, you're going to realize, oh, man, this is this is madness, <laughs> You know what I said? This Egyptian tology stuff is madness. Okay, so other than that, Israel, just watch this video. Share this video if you have to to the brothers and sisters that's in that madness. Hopefully they watch this video and come out of it. You know, come out of the philosophy of this foolishness. Come back to righteousness. They'll save Yahweh. Okay? Other than that, Israel, uh, watch this video. Shalom. In the beginning there was nothing. The universe consisted of a great chaotic ocean. And Ben-Ben emerged amid this primal chaos. Ben-Ben was a huge pyramidal mound. There was a lotus flower with Ben-Ben and this, when it blossomed, brought the god Ra to the world and light came with him. Ra by himself generated the first generations of gods. Shu, the god of the air, and Tefnut, the goddess of rain, were born. The universe was enwrapped by a vast mass of primordial waters. Shu and Tefnut plunged into the waters to explore its immensity. Ra felt afflicted after realizing that their children were taking a long time to return and fearing never seeing them again. He sent his best messenger to find them. Shu and Tefnut returned safe and sound and Ra's joy was so immense that human beings were born from his tears. After returning, their children generated in turn Geb, the god of the earth, and Nut, the goddess of the sky, and thus the sky and the earth were created. The great god Ra sovereignly ruled the universe power, and he was awarded the title of the first pharaoh. The god gifted Egypt with several sacred animals like the ox and the lion, but his greatest offering was the creation of the Nile River. Around its shores, men would edify a civilization glorifying the gods. But Ra had a premonition that his grandchildren would give birth to a new generation of gods who would put an end to his reign. And so the great god forbade the sky and the earth to have any offspring whatsoever. But Nut and Geb disobeyed and gave rise to a powerful offspring. Isis, Neph, Seth, and Osiris they dethroned Ra, and Osiris started to reign over the world. 
But the new god's throne was not safe, because his brother Seth was eager to take all power for himself. And so the saga of Egyptian gods began. After deposing the god Ra, the deity who gave origin to the Egyptian world, Osiris became the new god of the universe. The new supreme god took the goddess Isis as his wife and started a reign of great prosperity. Osiris brought civilization to men, who until that point lived quite primitively. The god taught them agriculture, weaving, and how to make bread. Besides that, he decreed the use of laws, which would give order to chaos. The Egyptian civilization began to flourish under the reign of the benevolent god Osiris. However, Osiris had a powerful and ambitious brother, Seth. His kingdom stood in the arid desert around Egypt. And so he was jealous of his brother, who had a fertile and prosperous kingdom. Osiris had an affair with Nephthys, Seth's wife, and Anubis, the god of the dead, emerged from this union. Angered by his brother's betrayal, Set prepared his revenge. The god of the dry lands and personification of evil invited Osiris for a great feast in his honor. During the feast, Seth gifted the guests with a beautiful coffin and said he would offer it to the one who fit into it perfectly. Osiris decided to try it and, immediately after settling in, Seth closed the coffin, trapping the god. The evil god threw the coffin into the Nile, drowning the supreme god. Isis wept profoundly after losing her beloved husband, and these tears poured into the Nile River, giving rise to its traditional floods. The goddess and her sister Nephthys looked for Osiris' body, and Isis, after finding it, tried to hide it. But Seth spotted it nonetheless, and smashed it into 42 pieces, spreading them throughout Egypt. Isis, with Anubis' help, managed to recover the pieces and, under the guidance of the god of the dead, she mummified Osiris. Using her divine powers, the goddess was able to resurrect her love, but Osiris would now reign over the world of the dead. After coming back to life, Osiris had a son with Isis. His name was Horus, and he swore he would defeat Seth, the usurper of the throne that was his by right. Seth, the god of destruction, had murdered Osiris, the god who reigned supreme in Egyptian mythology. Set took the throne from his brother for himself and unleashed his reign of terror. Nevertheless, Osiris had generated an heir together with the goddess Isis. His name was Horus. This was a falcon god, whose prophecy said that he would reign over the skies and would bring the light back to Egypt, ending the darkness brought by Set. Horus, already an adult, decided to claim his throne, which had been usurped by his uncle. The contention is judged by the gods, while the court, presided over by the sun god Ra, decided who would be worthy to sit on the throne. A series of clashes between Set and Horus had begun. Set had Ra's sympathy, since the usurper protected the sun god from the serpent Apophis, while the latter crossed the skies. Set proposed a challenge to Horus. Both would have to transform themselves into hippos and should be submerged for three months. Horus relied on his mother, the goddess Isis, to take advantage of Set's vulnerability to kill him. The goddess felt sympathy for Set and could not kill him. This betrayal enraged Horus, who then attacked his mother, cutting off her head. The god Toth, the deity of knowledge, saved the goddess replacing the severed head with a cow's head. The clash between Set and Horus continued for many years. When fighting in the desert, Set managed to pluck Horus's eyes. Due to Hathor's help, the goddess of love, Horus had his vision restored. The court of gods demanded a reconciliation between Set and Horus. The evil god, pretending to be benevolent, invited Horus for a feast in his palace. During the night, Set tried to abuse his nephew, making him unworthy to the throne. However, Horus managed to defend himself and prevented the god's poisonous seed.
Horus decided to take revenge and, with the help of the goddess Isis, the god placed his divine seed in lettuce leaves, which were then offered to Set by the goddess Isis. The god of barren deserts ate the contaminated lettuce. Poison, Set started to deteriorate in front of everyone, and a golden disc emerged in his forehead. Thoth grabbed the bright disc and ingrained it in her own head. Seth had been humiliated, and that was when, after 80 years, the court granted Horus the throne that was his by right. Isis couldn't be more proud to see her son, with Osiris assuming the father's throne. Seth's fate was to travel with Ra, the sun god of the skies, and his enraged screams could be heard with thunder. And so, Horus's reign over Egypt began, and all the pharaohs who one day reigned over Egypt were among his descendants. Ra is the sun god in Egyptian mythology. This god is usually depicted as a being with a man's body and a head of a falcon. The sun disk is over his head. He had been one day the greatest of all gods, but time wore him down and, finding himself too old, he decided to relinquish the power and go to the skies. This god is one of the most revered figures in Egyptian mythology. As the sun god, one of his duties was to drive away the darkness. And to accomplish his work, the god crossed the skies on his sunboat, lighting the whole world. But when the twilight came, he and his vessel plunged into the sea waters towards the underworld. There he would have to sail through the dark world and cross the twelve gates, which would be the twelve regions of the netherworld. Ra took an hour to go through each gate. Osiris was in one of them, the lord of the underworld, whom Ra always visited to pay his respects. But before leaving the underworld's darkness, the god was attacked by the terrible snake Apophis. This force of chaos tried to destroy the god's vessel, and each day the serpent seemed closer to accomplish her desire. Apophis once managed to swallow the sunboat, putting an end to the sunlight in the morning. But the serpent failed to hold the god in her stomach and regurgitated him. This event was marked as a solar eclipse. However, destroying Ra's boat became more difficult, since Set, the god of destruction, after losing the dispute of the supreme throne for Horus, had been condemned to navigate with Ra across the skies. He helped the sun god, defending his vessel against the terrible serpent defeating it several times, making Ra's underworld journey safer. The god Ra was a figure worshipped throughout Egypt, but this god was especially adored in the city of Heliopolis. The god's prestige was so vast that other traditions of Egyptian religions of antiquity merged the god's depiction along with the greatest figure of their own pantheons. For instance, the figures of the supreme gods Amun and Atum were also known as Amun-Ra and Atum-Ra. The god's name was used by many pharaohs. Ramses is a well-known example. His name means son of Ra, or the son of Sun, and so the pharaoh would strengthen his divinity before his subjects. Anubis, the god with a jackal head is a deity of the Egyptian mythology connected to life after death. The god is one of the most ancient Egyptian deities, and therefore his role changed as the centuries went by. Anubis was already considered the main deity linked to death and the underworld's god, but this role was transferred to the god Osiris. The jackal god was also considered the god of embalming and mummifications. In funeral rites, it was common to see a priest wearing a jackal mask, during the mummification process. The god was also considered as the protector of tombs and cemeteries, therefore protecting the bodies of those who went to the underworld. Anubis is the son of the goddess Nephthys, wife of Set. But his son was not born of the union with her husband, since Nephthys had been disguised as the goddess Isis, and so she mingled with Osiris. Set, coming to terms with that act of disloyalty, plotted against Osiris, killing him and scattering his body parts throughout Egypt. After Isis gathered all the parts, Anubis helped the goddess during the god's funeral ritual. 
So Anubis transformed the body of Osiris into the first mummy. Anubis became the deity that led the spirit of the dead to the underworld, where the dead would be judged by a court presided over by Anubis. The god placed the deceased's heart in Osiris's scale and the feather of truth on the other side. If the heart was heavier than the feather, it indicated that it was full of wickedness. He was then delivered to Amit, a demonic creature known as the Heart Devourer. If the feather was heavier than the light heart of the soul of the righteous and good, Anubis would take the person to Osiris, and the deceased stepped into life after death. In the period of Greek rule over Egypt, the god Anubis was associated with Hermes, which in Greek mythology is also a deity that led souls to the underworld. This association gave rise to a deity called Hermanubis, which became popular during the period of Roman rule. Anubis is certainly one of the most popular divinities in Egyptian mythology, the god accountable to lead souls to the afterlife. Bastet is the cat goddess in Egyptian mythology, depicted as having a woman's body with a cat's head. The Egyptians devoted great honors to cats. They were considered sacred animals. The felines had a meaningful role in the Egyptian world since, thanks to them, their food was safe from rodent infestations. Also, cats could scare treacherous, poisonous snakes. Bastet is a goddess associated with the sun, and because of that, the goddess followed Ra during the day in his solar boat, crossing through the skies. At night, the goddess turned into a cat, and, attentive, the goddess protected the world against the dreadful serpent Apophis. The goddess was worshipped throughout Egypt. Doing harm to any cat was a terrible sacrilege. The author of such a violent act could be punished with death. Cats were seen as family members, and, according to some reports, whenever a house was set ablaze, the cats entered the burning house to help their residents escape the fire. Sometimes, these cats appeared to be dead in the flames, but they returned to life thanks to the goddess Bastet, emphasizing the popular saying of a nine-life cat. For being sacred animals, cats were mummified, and Egypt has cemeteries dedicated to these animal mummies. According to some versions, the goddess Bastet is linked to Sekhmet, the lion goddess. This goddess was violent and bloodthirsty, but was tamed, becoming a gentle and milk-drinking cat goddess. In other versions, Bastet and Sekhmet were sisters and Ra's daughters. Even after the end of the worship of the Egyptian gods, cats to this day continue to look men up and down, hoping to have their deity acknowledged again.